You may be seated. Good morning, Grace Church. It's so good to be back here at the Shores campus. If we haven't met, my name's Larry. I'm one of your pastors. Uh, uh, I'm the pastor that gets to kind of be everywhere. My office is at the Cape campus, but on Sunday mornings, I'm usually at our Fort Myers Central campus uh, downtown. Uh, and it's extra good to be here today because I spent the last week in Ohio at uh, United Theological Seminary where I teach doctoral students, uh, and it was cold. Uh, so I'm really happy to be back in Southwest Florida. I woke up on the first morning, uh, and there was ice on my hotel room window. Uh, and that was bad enough, but about five minutes later, my wife texted me this photo of our backyard. <laughs> and I, I said, one of these things is really, really good. The other, not so much. Uh, had a great week with our uh, students launching a new cohort uh, in the doctor, the doctor of Ministry program there. Uh, so it was a really, really good week. Got home uh, from the airport, uh, didn't do a whole lot yesterday. Got in my truck this morning and found that my uh, iced coffee from last Sunday at Central had been sitting in my truck all week. One of those things, teaching, was very, very good. The other, not so much. Uh, my truck's going to smell for a bit. But when it comes to this uh, series that we've been sharing at Grace Church, Jesus Is, there's been nothing but good. There's been, there's been no bad in this. It's all been good news. Across all of our campuses of Grace Church, your pastors have been sharing the I am statements of Jesus. Uh, and so far, we've looked at three of them, and you have visual representations on your, your altar here. We've talked about uh, Jesus being the bread of life, Jesus being the light of the world. Uh, last Sunday, we talked about Jesus being the gate, and uh, I don't know how it's gone for you here at the Shores campus, but it's been a blessing to me to take a really slow walk through these important statements of Jesus, and the really good news is we have four more to go. Uh, so we're going to take a look at the next one of these statements from the Gospel of John, and this one comes to us from John chapter 10, where Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd. That's why the shepherd staff there, it's not to pull the pastor off the stage when we go uh, too long. And this one's really important because Jesus repeats it a couple of times, and he even gives a detailed explanation as to what he means by describing himself in this way. So we're going to look at all of the, uh, uh, we're going to look at eight full verses, uh, and then we're going to break it down. Notice what Jesus emphasizes by repetition. This is John chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen, I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. So there's a lot in those eight verses, so let's dive in and break it down. First, let's just consider that title that Jesus gives himself in verse 11 and then again in verse 14. Here it is, I am the good shepherd. And when Jesus uses this title about himself, the first listeners' minds would have been flooded with images that were found in their everyday life. Uh, it's not such a common image for us. Uh, if I were to talk about uh, a special that Starbucks is running, that might be a common image. If I talk about the fact that the Cowboys choked and don't get to play today, that's a common image uh, in our culture. I said that last week at Central with a Cowboys fan on the front row, and I almost died. It, it, didn't, uh, it didn't go real well. But this is a common image in their culture. Because sheep played a crucial role in their local economies for generations. And it's still true today. I've been to the Holy Land multiple times, and as you drive through the desert, there are still today Bedouin shepherds lining the sides of the road, and you can see them up in the, in the hill country. So this is a symbol that's relatable to the faithful followers of God through the, through the centuries. And in ancient times, shepherds were a common symbol for rulers. 
The Bible mentions sheep and shepherds over 500 times. And in the Old Testament, the title shepherd is used to depict God himself. And according to the Jewish worldview, from from Genesis through Psalms and, and beyond, God is the ultimate shepherd of Israel. While Moses and King David are seen as faithful human shepherds, God is the chief shepherd. The prophets foretold of a Messiah who would rule as a shepherd king over God's people. So it's an image that endured. Uh, Many of us have heard the words before of Psalm 23, where David makes a powerful five-word declaration. The Lord is my shepherd. Notice how personal this is. The Lord isn't a shepherd. He's not the shepherd. He's not someone else's shepherd. He's what? My shepherd. And that's our prayer for all of us today, to know Jesus as my shepherd. Which leads me to a question, though. If the Lord is a shepherd, what does that make us? Sheep, right. And in the scriptures, the sheep are used to describe the set-apart, chosen people of God as the sheep of his pasture. Uh, Here's a a fun fact. Uh, The Bible talks about sheep more than any other animal. Uh, Cattle come in second with 131 mentions. Dogs are mentioned 41 times. Eagles, 26 times. Cats aren't mentioned at all because they think they are God. (laughs) But we, we are referred to as sheep. Don't get too overconfident, though, uh, because sheep aren't the brightest bulbs in the box. This is why there are no sheep Olympics. Why? Because sheep aren't that smart. They, 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 They tend to wander. Uh, Pastor Wes, our lead pastor, was in Turkey a few months ago, and he heard a wild story about sheep. It was so wild that he wanted to look it up and verify that it was true before he came back and told the story. We verified it in several news outlets, and uh, what we learned was just a few years ago in a small town there, their economy was devastated because 500 sheep wandered one by one off of a cliff and fell to their death. Uh, They were owned by 26 different families who let their sheep graze together as a collective. And evidently, one wandered off the edge and fell to its death. And then one by one, more fell. 500 died, but guess what? Actually, over 1,500 fell off the cliff that day. A 1,000 of them survived. Why? Because their fall got shorter and shorter as the sheep piled up. The the, the income loss to those families, though, totaled over 100,000 U.S. dollars. So how can I say this really nicely? Sheep are stupid. They're they're, they're prone to wander. Uh, You would think that when the first sheep fell off the cliff, one of the others would have stopped and thought, that doesn't look like a good idea. But they didn't. One by one, 1,500 of them went over the side of that cliff and 500 of them wandered to their death. So before we get too overconfident, that's how the prophets of old Uh, when they were searching for how to describe humanity, chose sheep. Isaiah said this in Isaiah 56, 3, all of us, like, what? Sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Throughout human history and, and even now in our own lives, we often stray from our shepherd. And sometimes it's a really swift departure, like, like running away. But more commonly, it's a gradual wandering, a a nibbling our way from the presence and protection of our shepherd, following paths that lead us away from God. This this wandering leads us to some dangerous cliffs, like selfishness, a desire for control, a, a pursuit of pleasure, deception, greed, choosing the easy way over the right way, and other harmful shortcuts. In these ways, we unknowingly edge ourselves towards destruction by following the crowd. So recognizing the vulnerability of people, Jesus sees the crowds, feels compassion for them, and in Matthew's gospel compares them to sheep without a shepherd. Now, in John, by calling himself the shepherd, he declares his role as the Messiah, sent to rescue the sheep. And and similar to how sheep have a need for a shepherd for protection, 
we need Jesus to watch over our souls. But notably, Jesus emphasizes that he's not just any shepherd, but he's a good shepherd. And and don't miss that significance, it's crucial. Uh, Sheep lacking any sense of direction can easily get lost and they can fall prey to bandits and enemy shepherds. Yes, there were enemy shepherds. Jesus describes himself as good to distinguish from other shepherds who were bad and could potentially cause harm to the sheep. He was, of course, talking about the religious leaders of the day who were a recurring problem for the people of God. We usually think about the Pharisees and Sadducees when we talk about that. And Jesus labeled them as blind guides. How how can you guide the people? How can you guide the sheep when you don't know where you're going? They, They were abusive. They were unfaithful. They sought to harm God's flock, Jeremiah and Ezekiel say. Motivated by pride, not purity, they burdened the people. They looked down on them and they hypocritically appeared righteous while being corrupt within. In one place, Jesus says, you're whitewashed tombs. You look great on the outside, but you can polish a grave all you want because inside it's still full of dead things. In one of Jesus' sharpest criticisms, he says this in Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep but are really vicious wolves. They infiltrate the sheep by by looking harmless, but Jesus says they're really wolves in sheep's clothing. They're they're false prophets. You know what? There are still false prophets today. And, And to mature in our faith, we need to be able to discern when someone seemingly representing God is doing so in a way that's untrue. And Jesus says we'll be able to recognize what is true and what is false, what is good and what is bad, by the character they display. And the Pharisees, as blind guides, displayed no character. How do we discern this in our world? Our standard simply is to look to Jesus. The more a person or or a leader reflects the character of Jesus, the more true or good they are. But I want to go more personal. So for the time that remains, I want to look at what makes Jesus the shepherd that we can trust. So we're going to answer this question together. Why is Jesus the shepherd my soul needs? Uh, We're going to use Jesus' own words to find the goal, the bullseye, the true shepherd and the savior that we need. So first, and we've already seen this, is that Jesus is not just any shepherd, he's good. Jesus is a good shepherd. Say that with me. Jesus is a good shepherd. It's the first thing that Jesus says about himself in this passage, and that distinguishes himself above all of the others, is that he's good. Twice he says he's good. It makes it a little more complicated, but it's really important to fully understand that there are three languages kind of at play here. Jesus is speaking these words in Aramaic, uh, and and the Gospels are recorded in Greek. In in Aramaic, uh, goodness was used in relationship to another person. So with this in mind, when Jesus said he's good, it means he's good to his sheep. And then we add to that the rich meaning of the, uh, the word good in Greek that appears in our New Testaments. That word is kalos, and it means beautiful, as an outward sign of the inward good, noble, and honorable character. Good, worthy, honorable, noble, and seen to be so. So this isn't just somebody that says they're good. It's obvious to everyone that they're good. And adding again to this meaning... It's closely related to the Hebrew concept of goodness, the Hebrew word tov. You ever heard of the celebration mazel tov? That's the word tov. Tov is used over 300 times in the Old Testament, starting in Genesis as God looks at his creation and says, it is good. It's tov. When he he creates humanity, he looks at humanity and says, it's tov meod. It's very good. This, this idea of, of goodness speaks to a destiny of hidden goodness, like a seed of life. The, the goodness, the tove and mercy of God follows us all the days of our lives. And it's, it's so powerful that even the things that were meant for evil in our lives, God can transform for good. That's tove. So add all these layers, all these layers of meaning, and you have a promise that a relationship with Jesus will bring you a beautiful, honorable character of deep goodness planted so deeply in your soul that it will bear fruit and put even more goodness out into the world. What makes Jesus good? His goodness is consistent. 
It's unwavering. There's, there's no change or shadow within him. He remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. And to explain this, Jesus uses a simple illustration about two types of shepherds in his time. The hired hand and the owner. The hired hand has a different attitude and becomes a bad shepherd who abandons the sheep as soon as trouble arises. Look again at what we read earlier, John 10, 12. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. The wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. You ever had those kind of situations in life? You, you know the difference between hired hands and those who are owners. It's true in lots of different areas of life. For example, for, for most of my adult life, I lived in what's called a parsonage. And, and this is just a, a fancy church word for a home that the church owns and the pastor lives in it. So part of my compensation as a pastor was that my housing was provided for me, like, like a rental home that I didn't pay rent for. Oh, the good old days. <laughs> because anytime something would go wrong in one of those homes, I could call the church trustees and say the refrigerator died, do something about it. The air conditioner isn't working, help us. Uh, and someone would come and they would fix it. The good old days. <laughs> Since we moved to Florida, we've become first-time homeowners, and uh, we had an issue with our air conditioner shortly after moving in, in, in the boiling of July, uh, and I picked up my phone, and I didn't have a trustee to call. So I had to do the research. I had to figure out who I could trust with this problem because it was really my problem now. There's a different level of care and investment when it's your home versus a rental. My kids are so sick of me writing them about leaving pens and pencils laying around because our toddler loves to write on the wall. I care a lot more about it because it's my house. Because who's going to fix that? Who's going to paint it? Me. Jesus uses this type of illustration to share what makes him unique. He's the good shepherd because he's an owner. He doesn't just have compassion on the crowds that are lost. Jesus takes ownership and looks for the right action to make things right, to save the sheep. So let's keep going. What, why is Jesus the shepherd my soul needs? The second answer is this. Jesus willingly lays down his life for me. Say that with me. Jesus willingly lays down his life for me. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Uh, our, our best expressions of love are when we stoop to serve no matter the cost. It's the stories that we love to tell as a culture, when one person lays down their life for another. Many years ago in the first church that I served, it was a small town of about 500 people. I know that's hard to fathom. I served on that small town's fire department. Uh, and we, were, we referred to ourselves as foundation scrubbers because they'd just bring us in after the damage had already happened. But my favorite thing was the medical calls. There was nothing more exhilarating to me than the pager going off at 3 o'clock in the morning and jumping out of bed and running out of the house and seeing if I could beat everybody else to the fire department and be the first one to tell dispatch that we were on the way. My wife would tell you that she was not as fond of the 3 a.m. pager calls. And it was always fun, except one night. There was an officer in the next town, his name was Casey Colmeyer, and he was sitting in the center median of the highway with his canine partner, Draco, doing what he did, serving and protecting. And a drunk driver came through the center median and, and hit his car right on the side and rolled it and killed him and Draco instantly. And a lot of us were on that call that night and participated in his funeral uh, over, over the coming days. And I'll never forget the haunting sound of standing at his graveside and hearing all of our pagers go off, the pager that I once loved, and hearing the dispatcher call his badge number three times and no response. And that, as hard as that was, though, we remember Officer Colmeyer, somebody that laid down his life for others. He died in, in a spirit of sacrifice, laying down his life doing what he felt called to do, making sure that others were safe. And that was just on a stretch of highway in Illinois. Jesus laid down his life for all of humanity. And when the, when the enemies of our soul, sin, Satan, evil, death, when they attacked God's good creation, 
Jesus was sent by God to rescue us. As the, as the perfect and sinless one, he, he descended from heaven, all the pageantry of the throne room of heaven, and he entered into human history to rewrite it, to redeem your story, to redeem my story. The ugliness of sin was so profound that God had to die to make it beautiful. Isaiah, the one who described us as sheep who had gone astray, foretold of a Savior who would be pierced for our transgressions, who would be crushed for our sins. The punishment that we deserve would be placed on him instead. Jesus takes into himself the ugliness of sin. He experiences it on the cross. The, the living water dies thirsty, without shame but naked on a Roman cross, crowned with thorns instead of gold. The good shepherd willingly lays down his life for you and me, displaying profound significance from the cross. And he does that willingly. And Jesus states that in the, in the, in the passage that, that he willingly lays down his, his life and he has authority to lay it down and authority to take it back up. It's not coercion. He chooses the cross out of love, compassion, a desire to be your shepherd. Beyond dying for you, he doesn't stay dead. He rises from the dead on the third day, stripping away the power of enemy, and that oldest enemy, death, once and for all. Under the care of Jesus, the good shepherd, we receive the promise of eternal life, the power over sin in this life, and a personal relationship with a God who can be our forever friend. These gifts are not earned. They're, they're given freely, waiting for anyone who will say yes to Jesus as the shepherd leader of their lives. Jesus says in the passage that he has other sheep that he needs to bring into his care. Maybe that's you today. But before I start preaching too much, let's go back to the question. Why is Jesus the shepherd my soul needs? Say it with me. Jesus knows me and invites me to know his voice. Let's look again at verses 14 and 15. Jesus describes the depth of relationship that he wants with you. I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Now between Jesus saying I am the gate last week and I'm the good shepherd today, you've probably learned more about sheep than you ever wanted to. But to really grasp this statement, we need to know one more thing. Sheep have a ton of liabilities and vulnerabilities. We've talked about that. But one thing that they do exceedingly well is they can distinguish between the voices that they hear. So in the ancient world, when you would go into a city, you would leave your sheep outside the city gates. There'd be a communal pen, and all these sheep from different flocks would be, be put in together. When their shepherd would come back out and call them, they didn't have to worry about the sheep getting mixed with others because they knew the sound of their shepherd's voice. Now, I don't know a lot about sheep, but I grew up around cattle, and I can tell you that those cows knew my grandpa's voice, that they had a comfort with him that they didn't have with anyone else. Uh, when I was younger and I hadn't spent a lot of time there, if I walked into a crowd of cattle, they were really skittish around me. But Pawpaw could have a bunch of them in the corral, and he'd go in there and walk among them to sort them out, which ones needed to go to the weaning field, which one were, were, were going to auction. And he could weave and walk and move among them, and they didn't care. They trusted him. What always impressed me the most, though, was how they responded to his voice. Uh, he, he had this goofy call that, that, that he did to call them in from pasture into the feeding area or the corral. And I can't even replicate the sound he makes because it's so goofy. But it didn't matter what part of our really large 800-acre farm they were on. When they heard him make that call, they'd come rushing to his direction. They knew his voice. And, and throughout the Old Testament, when things were going well, God's chosen people heard God's voice, and they heard it when they were obedient. Sheep can even respond to a name. They can recognize a name that's given to them, and shepherds in Jesus' day actually named their sheep. And in the same way, the Old Testament says that God knows his own by name. The relationship that Jesus desires is the same level of authenticity and intimacy that he shares with his Father. 
Remember that in the Gospel of John, each of these I am statements has a corresponding sign or story that helps us to understand. It confirms the statement. So the sign that corresponds to this statement, I am the good shepherd, has to do with knowing and hearing the voice of Jesus. It's a really quick but powerful story that we can probably all relate to. This takes place after Jesus has fed the crowds with the the little boy's lunch, five loaves and two fish. And after that miracle, he withdraws from his disciples to go spend some time with his father. So we pick up this story in John 6, starting with verse 16. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. Duh. But he said to them, it is I. Don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. So, so, so picture this. It's dark. They're tired. The disciples are crossing the sea, and this sudden storm hits. It probably happens often. I've seen it happen in Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is really a lake. It's surrounded by hills on all sides, and, 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 and quick and threatening winds and waves come up really unexpectedly, and it's hard even for skilled fishermen that are among the disciples to navigate. So they're struggling to, to, to navigate the storm by, by rowing. And the sea is like eight miles wide from where point A to point B. It's 200 feet deep, and it's adding to the difficulty. And in that culture, add to this that the sea symbolizes chaos. It symbolizes the depths of hell. There was a belief that the sea housed evil spirits and demons. So in the midst of the storm, the disciples spot a man walking on the water toward their boat. We don't need this right now. We've got enough going on. They're already on edge. They become even more frightened because no one's ever seen anything like this. They start to entertain fears of a demon or a spirit of a drowned sailor seeking revenge, common fears at that time. But their anxiety turns to relief when they hear the voice of the good shepherd. Jesus declares what's recorded in Greek, a go, a me. We translate it, it is I. But in Greek, watch this, it means I am. Oh, I could do four nights in a revival on that. <laughs> he, he, he literally says to them, I am, so don't be afraid. Can you imagine how their anxiety turned to relief? Comforting words, I am, so don't be afraid. Despite the the flood of fear and terror that had occupied their minds, the disciples recognize and they trust the voice of Jesus, the good shepherd, like sheep discerning the true and trusted voice that brings them reassurance. How do we do that in our lives? How How do we know in the midst of our anxieties and our fears when Jesus is speaking and not our fears? not our own ideas, not what's planted there by culture. Two really quick tips for us, and then I'm going to sit down. First, we can know that Jesus will never contradict himself or his heavenly father. If you need to know if it's the voice of Jesus or not speaking into your life, his voice will never go against the character of God or the word of God contained in the scriptures. Jesus will not contradict himself. Secondly, whatever Jesus is saying to me will be for his glory, not for mine. When I try to outrun God's timing or or step into a situation where I can secretly be the savior, that's not me, that's not the Holy Spirit talking, that's me. So in this scene, Jesus reveals both his extraordinary power and his profound compassion. His unmistakable power is vividly portrayed as he walks on water. This is bigger bigger than Moses, the one that they looked to the most. He, He walked through the parted Red Sea on dry ground, but Jesus is walking on the water. And he's symbolically asserting authority even over the chaos. A feat that only God could do. However, Jesus doesn't just embody strength. He also exudes compassion to his core. In the face of his his friends, his disciples' fear, exhausted from battling the storm and rowing, Jesus takes the initiative to approach them. The compassionate aspect solidifies Jesus as the good shepherd. When he reaches the boat, 
I am. So don't be afraid. And I love this part that we usually miss. It says then that the disciples then were willing to take him into the boat. It's not just a physical action like, oh, okay, he can come in now. Uh, It signifies welcoming Jesus into their fear, into their chaos, into their lives. John's writing this to instill belief in Jesus and those of us who would read it centuries later. Jesus emerges as the shepherd that our souls desperately need. But he's not just any shepherd, he's good. Just like lost sheep we stray, we face threats from wolves and sheep's clothing. They come at us, these bad shepherds, from every different direction. From from, uh, the things that we consider in this world that try to tell us how to think, how to act, what to do, how to vote, who to follow. But Jesus is not that false prophet. He is unequivocally good and he willingly lays down his life for us, knowing us intimately and desiring that we would recognize his voice. So I have two questions for you that I want you to consider this week. Do I know the voice of Jesus? Do I know it? Then am I being led by the voice of Jesus? Two related questions. Well, there's a little difference in the answer. Do I know and trust the voice of Jesus? And am I being led by the voice of Jesus? The truth is, friends, we're all being led by someone or something. And there are so many different options. There are so many different things vying for our allegiance in this world and in our culture. I want to make sure that I know and trust and recognize the voice of my good shepherd. And even more than that, that I'm being led by that voice. How about you? Pray with me. Jesus, you are our shepherd. And more than that, you are our good shepherd. Your goodness is on display all throughout the scriptures. From the, from the opening words, Father of Genesis, when you looked at your good creation and you stood back, and you said, this is good. When you created humanity in your image, You looked at the man and the woman and you said, this is very good. The crown jewel of all that you had created. So when sin entered the world and called us us astray and we went astray and pulled us in different directions of vying allegiance, you looked at your very good creation and you sent your perfect son to willingly lay down his life for us. So Jesus, would you help us today to know your voice, to trust your voice, and to be led by your voice. Jesus, it's in your name that we pray. Amen. As we sing this next song, I will let you know that the altar is open for you today if you need to pray about either of those questions. Do I know and recognize the voice of Jesus? And am I being led by the voice of Jesus? Let's stand together and sing about the goodness of our God.